cover-up began to emerge. We were at the station just a week after he was killed, and many of the facts we've covered were already public knowledge. But still, some of the locals made excuses for the police. What did you witness with the, the unfortunate Brazilian man that died? We all we saw was the police running in to the station with guns. That's all we saw. We didn't see anything else at all. And then after that, a couple of seconds after that, we were vacated down South Lambeth Road. That was all we saw. We didn't see anything else. I mean, are you sad for him and his family that he's dead? Oh, yeah, but at the end of the day, he should have stopped and surrendered, shouldn't he? If it's happened in his own country, he would have been shot down as well. So, with all that's gone on, the police were only doing what they thought was best, as why far as I'm he, concerned. Why do you think he ran? Well, because his visa had run out, obviously, but he's not going to have armed police running after him just because his visa's run out, has he? So, the police were protecting, you know, the people travelling on the, on the tube, so I don't see any wrong in what the police have done at no, all. No, I, I understand your view on that. Why do you think they shot him eight times in the head? Oh, I don't know. It's a lot of times to shoot him. It is a lot of times to shoot him. How but many times did you hear they shot him? Five at first. Five, and then, no, three first, then five, then it went up to eight. So... And I, the police admit they tackled him and then shot him. Well, they told him to surrender, didn't they? They told him to stop, and he didn't. He carried on running, so... You know, what else could they have done, as far as I'm concerned? 007, huh? 007. License to kill. Yeah. I still believe that there should be a shoot-to-kill policy. I still believe, personally. But that's my views, you know. I think people should give up their liberty for freedom. All right. London police were later forced to admit that Mr. Dominez never ran from them wasn't wearing a heavy coat, and that a special army unit had killed him execution style with over 10 shots to the head at point-blank range. The British government was so desperate to keep the details of the shooting secret that they went so far as to arrest an ITN television journalist who had simply gotten a copy of what would normally be a public police report. Government whistleblowers and police have also been suspended and arrested for telling the truth. We had our details taken and were threatened with arrest simply for asking questions of locals outside the Stockwell station and videotaping police. Um, where are you based? Austin, Texas. Uh, Alex, what's your date? Uh, 2 11 Would you just rather see the driver's license? No, I said, yeah. Well, here, just let me do it. Take it down. That's all I need, man. Well, I mean, you're just uh, you're filming for, for uh, a program back in the states or something. Exactly. In fact, I think it'll probably be broken into. Uh, it'll probably be broken into. Think about it. Yeah. It'll, it'll, yeah. Sir, what do you think about this event? I think it's very bad that has happened. <laughs> what do you think should happen? I think the policy of shooting should have been more thoroughly thought out. I'm afraid there must have been a terrible mistake here. I feel very sorry for the family and very sorry for the policeman that made a horrible mistake. Yeah, it's going to be bad for everybody. It's a tragedy all around, I think. Thank you. The police first claimed that it was a hot morning when official weather reports showed that it was around 60 degrees and that Mr. Dimenez was running down the street wearing a giant padded coat with wires sticking out of it, that he vaulted over the turnstiles, charged through a crowd of pedestrians, raced onto the train and was about to detonate bombs when the heroic officers gunned him down. The authorities then conveniently claimed that all the surveillance cameras malfunctioned that morning. Police have now been forced to admit, thanks to watchdogs in their ranks, that none of the cameras malfunctioned, and they've now released the video. The government has now been forced to admit that he was wearing a light denim jacket, and there were no wires of any type. Police that weren't part of the special military unit didn't know why they killed him. The police had followed him from his home. They knew that he was a Latin Brazilian working in England as an electrician. They followed him for 30 minutes as he walked from his home towards the station. Once in the station, he calmly picked up a Metro paper, paid for his ticket with his Metro Oyster card, and then walked onto the train. Passengers then reported that they were told to get off the train. Once they'd stepped off, still looking through the windows, they saw the Special Forces police squat on Mr. Dominguez and shoot him over ten times in the head. Witnesses said Dominguez looked at the authorities as if he knew them. He was like a scared rabbit, and he was killed execution style. The question is why.
A special military hit team stalked him and tracked him from his home to the train station and then killed him in cold blood, making sure he was dead. It's well known that if somebody has a bomb, you don't shoot at them, and you certainly don't get near them. No, Mr. Dominguez had seen something he wasn't supposed to see. He learned a little too much, and he had to be eliminated. Within hours of the 7-7 bombings, Israeli Army Radio was reporting that Benjamin Netanyahu, the former Prime Minister of Israel, had been warned not to leave his hotel that morning to attend a meeting less than a hundred yards away from one of the train stations that was bombed. The Associated Press ran the headline, Netanyahu changed plans due to warning. Then the current Prime Minister, Ariel Sharon's office, instructed Israeli officials not to give interviews to the foreign media concerning the warning. Israel's foreign office attempted to spin the story, saying that they'd given a general warning to the British that day. Then several weeks later, the head of Mossad told a major German newspaper that he indeed had issued a warning to Benjamin Netanyahu at 8.40 a.m., 10 minutes before the first blast. Conveniently for authorities, the bus surveillance camera malfunctioned. Something else happened that was convenient for the establishment line. All four of the supposed bombers' identification cards survived unscathed at all four events. But there was just one problem. In one case, one of the bombers' IDs was found at two separate locations. As the evidence mounts, it is crystal clear. Only criminal elements of the British government could stage the attacks and then engage in the cover-up. The reason the Netanyahu story is important is it clearly shows that other intelligence agencies were aware of what was going on in London that day and took necessary precautions to protect their Minister of Finance. In 1994, the Israeli embassy in London uh, was bombed. This was at a time when I was in the service. I joined the Middle Eastern section shortly after that. And I was actually astounded um, to read a document written by a senior MI5 officer who'd seen all the information coming in about this attack. And he said that he believed that the Israelis had bombed their own embassy. In any staged terror attack, governments have to be extremely careful to keep the operation shielded, compartmentalized. Most people in government are moral individuals who believe that they're standing up for their nation's sovereignty or its national interest. And it's absolutely essential to keep them in the dark. One of the chief tools used by governments as a smoke screen is staging exercises or drills at the exact same time and exact same places as real events. When the Oklahoma City Federal Building was bombed, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms was staging an anti-terror drill with their bomb squad on the morning of April 19, 1995, at the same time that the real event took place. On the morning of September 11, 2001, the Pentagon was running five separate drills, two of the drills targeting the exact same targets at the exact same time. That caused NORAD to stand down, believing it was just a drill. And London was no different. It's important to note that those taking part in the drills need not know that they're part of a larger operation. In fact, it's better for the conspirators that they not be informed. One of the chief reasons this is done is so that if any of the operatives carrying out the attack are caught by other elements of the government, they can simply claim that they were taking part in a drill or an exercise. NSA, InfoPol 9, and Echelon type systems that are scanning for terrorist chatter will be fooled into believing they've simply picked up part of an exercise. On the morning of 7-7 in London, there was a simultaneous exercise targeting the exact same trains, the exact same bus, at the exact same locations, at the very same time. What we're supposed to believe is some kind of coincidence. There was also an anti-terrorist drill going on on 7-7. And again, just like 9-11, they were talking about attacks on the same targets, the same kind of tube stations, and exactly the same time as the actual attack happened. We learned of the drills of 7-7 on 7-7 from Peter Power, the head of Visor Consultants, a crisis management firm based in London. Mr. Power was the former spokesperson for Scotland Yard. Mr. Power told National British Television, ITN News, about the drills. Uh, today we were running an exercise for a company, bearing in mind I'm now in the private sector, and we sat everybody down in the city, a thousand people involved in the whole organization, but the crisis team 
And the most peculiar thing was we based our scenario on the simultaneous attack.